articulation of the language. So here is when the structuralists like Andra Martinet and Saucier uh, come very useful and, and, and uh, analyzing uh, the connotation, the notation of the language, etc., etc. But we enter into problems when we go to an experimental point in general, because usually we don't have only one medium, but several mediums, uh, as you know. So we have verbal, written languages, but we have also images. We have, we may have uh, uh, formulas. Uh, if we are talking about fractal poetry, we may have um, also uh, kinetic um, operations that. Uh, visual languages, etc., etc. It depends on the, on the type of experimental poem. We may find different mediums. Um, so that changes um, the way we, we, we have to approach uh, experimental poem. Another feature of conventional po poetry is that it requires a pre-established order of reading marked by grammatical rules. We have to read the poem starts at a particular point in time is needed and, and placed in the, in the page. And we have to keep reading. It's a sequential reading and we have to uh, finish that reading. In an experimental poem, there is usually there is no a pre-established order of reading. So there are multiple and simultaneous centers for me of meaning, patterns and readings. Um, usually there is no this sequentiality. And, and order uh, that re is required by the verbal uh, poem, isn't it? So another point is uh, the verbal poem requires a formal homogeneity. Um, there must be some logic into, into the written language that they are uh, um, exposing. In, a, in an experimental poem, uh, we have um, formal heterogeneity, several integrated languages such as photography, grammatics, sound, etc. So it's not just simple languages but also integrated languages. So there is a basic hybridity and heterogeneity uh, of languages. Um, there is no sequentiality like in the verbal poem but simultaneity. All the information is present at the same time in the surface of the poem. That is a basic difference from a conventional written poem. You have to read it sequentially according to the grammar rules, grammatical rules. In an experimental or visual or sound poem, it doesn't work the same way. Um, and another point that we may contrast between a verbal poem and an experimental poem is that the temporal and spatial relations are controlled by the medium, usually, in the verbal poem. In the experimental poem, I think um, temporal and spatial relations are discontinuous not controlled by the mediums used in the poem. It's, it's, and in each reading, we, we, we may see or activate different patterns, relations between um, science and um, the meaning changes. Um, so it works very different. Um, in a verbal poem, usually we decode the, the written language. We, we start with the denotative level. In an experimental poem, Instead of decoding a specific language, we may transcode, we may transfer information from different media and, and synthesize uh, some of those um, inputs of information. So there are basic differences uh, in, in, in these uh, types of poems. Um, so I, I, I would say that um, structuralism, for instance, it's a very valid approach for um, uh, when analyzing verbal poems. Um, it's a partial approach when uh, approaching uh, or analyzing an experimental poem. Uh, so it's not enough. We, we, we need more. Um, okay. Um, okay. So um, some of the. I mean, there are more approaches to experimental poetry that we can. Uh, underline here or highlight, but I think mm, the most important ones um, are the ones that I mentioned before, which are, we can see them here. Um, I am going to start with uh, a little bit of structuralism and post-structuralism. Okay. 
So, structuralism was one of the most popular approaches in academic fields concerned with the analysis of language, culture, and society. The origins of structuralism connect with the work of Ferdinand Saussure on linguistics, along with the linguistics of the Prague and Moscow schools. And we may define structuralism as uh, schools of thought that uh, understand uh, they work with the structures modeled on language, and there is no intrinsic reason why a specific sign is used to express a given signifier. So signs are arbitrary. Signs gain their meaning from their relationships and contrasts with other signs. So they, they, they start with that fundamental um, idea that the, the language is the um, zero point of operations for uh, giving meaning. They do not, probably one of the, of the differences with other um, schools of thought is that the structuralism always starts with the linguistic or verbal thinking. They do not include visual thinking or other ways of, of uh, processing meaning. It all starts in the language. And the language has a basic structure. And they start up with the sign, and then uh, it's like the atoms. <laughs> they, they divide the sign between among signified signifiers, and according to the scholar, uh, they develop this basic structure. Um, okay. After structuralism uh, had its um, uh, highlights or uh, its uh, golden age, uh, it came post structuralism. Um, this approach uh, has different uh, scholars and, and schools as well, but they don't think in terms of a basic structure. They think that um, a text uh, has different meanings, you know, um, and the meaning is always unstable and decentered. So um, it's not about the author. It's about the reader itself reading the text, and the text is uh, produces multiple interpretations all the time. So under this basic approach, or post-structuralism approach, we have different schools like the constructionism, feminist criticism. We have the uh, Foucault, Barthes, etc. Post-Lacan or post-Lacanian um, scholars. At the same time, structuralism and post-structuralism have no clear distances. Um, they are related. So it's not that they, one is against the other. We could use uh, both um, basic ap approaches uh, when analyzing an experimental poem uh, without, I mean, I think it, it gives us, uh, uh, enhances the multiple meanings of, of, of a possible text that is complex itself. So, one post structuralism doesn't uh, eliminate structuralism uh, necessarily. But, um, let's see. Okay. So, basically, yeah, we have uh, Ferdinand de Saussure, um, Andre Martinet, uh, Roman Jankoson, Louis James Lem. Michael or Michel Refater and Pierce um, all develop in different um, structures of, of, of the sign and, 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 and uh, the language itself. So um, then we have another important school, which is also based on structuralism, and is semiotics. And um, today, semiotics um, it's understood. Or a modern notion of semiotics is that it's more than a mode of textual analysis. Um, a text can exist in any medium and may be verbal or non-verbal or both. So they have a very inclusive notion of text and sign. So semiotics is a very valid uh, approach as well. Uh, for them, in general, a text is an assemblage of signs, which can be can include words, images, sounds, gestures constructed and interpreted with reference to the conventions of a genre 
and in a meeting. So this is basic uh, template for us to use uh, for any experimental poem. Um, so we have one of the key figures of semiotics is Roland Barthes. And more recently, another one is um, Chris and Van Loon. Uh, Roland Barthes in the 60s, at the end of the 60s, um, in rhetoric of the image, argues that images and their symbolic meanings are always contingent upon the verbal text. In order to reach the shared meaning, verbal text must enforce the visual with evidence. So while Barthes says that the image or the text can come first, without the text, the visual alone is too ambiguous. So they still rely um, on the text, on the text, on the words, uh, in order to have a complete meaning. But more recently, in 2006, Kreis uh, and Van Leeuwen, in their book Reading Images, the Grammar of Visual Design, they believe that visual images can accomplish the same message and meaning that text can, but perhaps in a different way. So, in, in, somehow they depart from words, they oppose uh, from words, um, and include.